Hey, what's up guys? It's Hazard. I'm a fighter pilot for the Air Force. Today we're going to be talking about what it's like to use Max Afterburner taking off in a fighter like the F-16 or the F-35. Now there are a lot of videos out there that talk about the physics behind it. This is going to be that first person perspective. Before we get started, if you're new to this channel, my name is Hazard. I'm a fighter pilot for the Air Force. Spent the first half of my career flying the F-16 and now I fly the F-35. If you enjoy this, make sure to subscribe turn on notifications and like this video. All right, so let's do a quick rundown of what Afterburner is. So our engines are low bypass turbofan engines. So similar to what's on an airliner, only instead of big, wide, fat engines, we have narrow engines so that we don't produce as much drag when we're going supersonic. Now on the back side of this, we have something called an Afterburner or augmenter, or if you're British, it's called a reheat. So the air, when it goes through these low bypass turbofan engines, there's still 50% of the oxygen in that air. So we can do something with that. So what we do is we inject fuel via spray bars, that aerosolized fuel sprayed in there, and then we light it off. And it's like a, a rocket or a flamethrower. So the advantage is we can produce a lot of thrust. So a modern engine produces about eight times the thrust of what it weighs, which is really, it's an incredible testament to the engineering that uh, Pratt & Whitney, what GE, have been able to do with their engines. Now, it's a lot less when you strap wings onto it, a pilot, avionics, cockpit, fuel, all that. It goes down to about one to one, but that's still amazing. So we can accelerate in the vertical. Now, the downside is we burn gas tremendously fast when we're using afterburner. So I can remember being in Korea and I was flying supersonic in the F-16 Block 40 and I looked down and there's a fuel flow gauge on the right side of the uh, instrument console and it said 50,000 pounds an hour. 50,000 pounds an hour. So just for perspective, the F-16 only carries 7,000 pounds of fuel internally. So you only have a few minutes in afterburner. Remember, you need to be able to get back to base and then to have a reserve cushion. Now we can augment our gas carrying fuel tanks. So an air to air configuration, usually we have a centerline bag or an air to ground configuration. We have two big uh, external fuel tanks on the jet. But even in that air to ground configuration, we can only carry 12,000 pounds of fuel. So you're still talking just a couple minutes in afterburner. So let's talk about when we're gonna use afterburner during a sortie. So the first time is gonna be on takeoff. So depending on the conditions, we can do either what's called a mill power takeoff. So that's the maximum thrust without afterburner. So using that low bypass turbofan engine, or we can supplement it with maximum afterburner. Now, times we would use maximum afterburner are if we're carrying a lot of ordnance and fuel, if we have a short runway, if we have high density altitude. So if we're in Phoenix in the summer or the Middle East and it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a time when we're gonna wanna use afterburner to take off. The reason has to do with our ability to stop by the end of the runway should we have a loss of thrust or a reason to abort. By using afterburner it allows us to take off shorter and that gives us a longer amount of time to abort. Now, we still have a hook on the aircraft, there I said it, Air Force aircraft, at least fighters have hooks on them, so it's not just limited to Navy, but they're really only meant to be used a couple times throughout the course of the lifetime of the uh, F-16. So typically for Air Force bases, we have two departure end cables and uh, we can drop the hook and we can stop, but that's more of a last resort. We wanna be able to accelerate all the way to takeoff speed. And if we have to abort, abort, apply the brakes. We have small brakes because we wanna save weight and then to stop by the end of the runway. So other times when we would wanna use afterburner are obviously when we wanna go fast. So most aircraft are not super cruise capable. So that means that we need to use afterburner to go supersonic. For those that don't know, supersonic is going faster than the speed of sound. So a good example is thunder and lightning. So lightning, you'll see the flash, and then it takes a few seconds for the thunder to get to you. That's the speed of sound. So that's what Chuck Yeager famously broke back in the 1940s. But if we want to go supersonic, we'll use afterburner. Other times I've used afterburner are when we are trying to be on the tanker with a lot of fuel and a lot of weapons. So I remember being in Afghanistan, we were loaded down quite a bit, and we were having to use afterburner to stay on the boom, which is pretty crazy to think about because you think of the tanker as being pretty slow. But we were just so loaded up that uh, we had to plug in the afterburner for about a second at a time and then go to mill power and then slowly start falling off the boom and then go kick it back into AB. And you really don't have the fidelity in AB that you do when you're out of afterburner. So it makes it pretty tricky to refuel when you're doing that. 
Other times we're gonna use afterburner or when we wanna max perform the aircraft. So we have a lot of tactics where we're gonna use afterburner. I'm not gonna go into the details on here, but anytime we're looking to max perform the aircraft, we're gonna use afterburner, but we wanna use it sparingly. So that's something we really teach young wingmen is to save their fuel, save your gas, so that you're not wasting it because you wanna use afterburner during those critical periods of time throughout a sortie. All right, so here's a story from my first time taking off an afterburner. So this was back in 2011. I was learning how to fly the F-16 Block 40 at Luke Air Force Base, and we had completely clean jets. So that's a pretty rare configuration. Typically, we have that centerline bag as an air-to-air -air configuration or two external bags uh, for that air-to-ground configuration. But it takes a really long time to switch between those configurations. So the director of operations had decided that they're just gonna drop the external uh, bags because we had some advanced students going through learning how to be forward air controllers. So this was gonna be the first time taking off an afterburner and it was gonna be in a completely clean jet. So typically for these sorties, you're gonna be leading them for the initial phase of flight. So you're learning how to fly from point A to point B but I needed to learn how to do a trail departure. So I was the wingman that day, I was taking off number two. So we get out to the runway and we get cleared for takeoff. I watch my flight lead taxi onto the runway and then uh, plug it in the afterburner. And I see the nozzle of his jet closed down. And so that's the optimum nozzle geometry for military power. And then I saw a bloom and a 30 foot flame shoot out the back of the jet and he rocketed down the runway. I counted to 15 seconds because that produces quite a bit of wake turbulence. And then I push the throttle forward. Now with F-16, it has a unique throttle. You push it all the way forward until it hits the stop. That's military power. In order to go into AB, you need to rotate it outward and then push it further forward. And that's going to be the different afterburner settings. And I remember thinking that nothing was happening. So this was time dilation. It had only been maybe a second, but it felt like 10 seconds. And it was just enough time for me to look down and say, what's going on? Check my engine gauges. And that's when the thrust hit me and flung me back. Pulling Gs in these aircraft, typically it's on the vertical axis. So it's pushing or pulling blood rather from our head all the way into our legs. But this was horizontal G. So it was almost like an astronaut when they're blasting in the space and they're laying down. So it was through the chest that I was feeling the, the G force. And I remember thinking that this was the fastest that I'd ever accelerated. So I guess technically I had used afterburner in the T-38, but that was really nothing compared to this. And that was just enough time for me to think that. And then I felt the second ring of afterburner light off. So there are five rings of afterburner in these engines because you don't want to flood the engine. You don't want all the rings to just start spraying fuel. You want to do it sequentially. And so I was only on the first ring of afterburner and by the fifth ring i felt like i was in a, a different dimension so my brain was still on the ground and we were already approaching uh 155 knots so that's about 175 miles an hour and so that's the rotate speed as soon as i got airborne retracted the gear and the interesting thing about a fighter is as you go faster you accelerate faster so that's a lot different than a car so a car zero to 60 comes a lot faster than 60 to 120. Now in a fighter, it's the opposite. So as you go faster, you accelerate faster to a point, of course. So once you start getting about above 500 miles an hour, you start incurring a lot of parasitic drag and you start slowing down. But from like 200 to 400, you are accelerating extremely quickly. So I actually came close to overspeeding the gear. So almost ripping the gear off, I was accelerating so quickly. So clearly behind the jet for that first afterburner takeoff, now, after having done it probably around a thousand times, so did it quite a few times in the F-16, and then now I'm flying the F-35, and the F-35 has the Pratt & Whitney F-135 engine, and that's, that's the single greatest engine ever developed. And if you wanna think otherwise, I'll fight you, but it's an amazing engine. Now, it's still an awesome experience to take off an afterburner, but uh, you know it's definitely not like that first time uh, taking off. It's almost, like if you take somebody from the 1800s and just put them into a, a regular car, regular sedan, it's gonna absolutely blow their mind. But for us, it's not that big of a deal. And when you lead other aircraft, as you get more experienced, you're thinking about those other aircraft, you're thinking about the next few steps, as opposed to just getting caught up in the moment like that. All right, so I'm finally gonna be announcing the winner of my patch. So the winner is Luke 
Kuklis. So Luke Kuklis, let me know in the comments how I can contact you and then I'll be sending you your patch next week. For those that left comments, it was truly uh, inspiring to read those comments. So for people that don't know, I asked people in my last video to leave their most inspiring story of 2020. Obviously 2020 was a tough year for most people, but I think it's important to be able to you know, find the good in, in the bad and use as motivation to get better. So there are some incredibly inspiring stories, everybody from somebody who beat cancer to Luke who had a friend who unfortunately passed away and he was able to raise money for his family. So really inspiring, thank you. It's not fair for me to not give my most inspiring moment of 2020 and that was having my son. So back in April, kind of during the height of the COVID scare, my wife and I had our first kid and it was amazing. Truly a life-changing experience. Um, it's been amazing to, to watch him grow. Children, you know, babies, they learn something new each day. And so it's inspiring to, to be a father, to be caring for, uh, you know, my son. And then also it's motivating to see, you know, this is what a child does. He continues to learn. He's not caught up in all the things that are going on in his life. He's just learning new things and getting better each day, which is pretty inspiring to see. So there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to subscribe, turn on notifications and like the video, and I'll talk to you next time.